Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas believes in honest conversations like the one you're about to see. For thoughtful insights related to healthcare policy, check out our Blue Promise podcast and videos. Learn more at standingwithtexas.com. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Abby Livingston, the Washington Bureau Chief of the Texas Tribune, and I'm here in Washington. And I want to thank you all for tuning in to today's virtual event from the Texas Tribune. I am joined today with the Democratic Senate, uh, with a Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate, uh, MJ Hager. We'll be discussing her 2020 campaign ahead of the runoff next week and what it's like to run a virtual campaign uh, until about 1245 this afternoon. We'll also be going over questions submitted by our readers, which are often the best questions throughout this conversation. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors, AT&T, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas, Texas 2036 and Walmart. We also want to thank KXAN for their media support. Though donors and corporate sponsors underwrite our efforts, they play no role in determining the content panelists or line of questioning. That was all me. Finally, I would like to introduce today's guest, veteran MJ Hager. Hager is a retired Air Force officer, helicopter pilot, and Purple Heart recipient. In 2012, she successfully sued the Department of Defense to repeal the ground combat exclusion policy, which prevented women from serving, serving in combat positions. Last April, she announced her candidacy for the U.S. Senate. Following the March primary election, Hager, whose campaign has been backed by national Democrats, let, led the vote tallies, advancing her to the runoff alongside State Senator Royce West. The winner of Tuesday's runoff will face Republican U.S. Senator John Cornyn in November. Major Hager, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Abby. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we're very excited about this. So my first question is my question in all of these interviews. Um, and, and it's especially prescient today or matters. Um, Texas is in a whole lot of trouble. How are you doing? How is your family doing? How is your campaign doing? You know, I talk to people every day and I recognize we're we're better off than most. Um, you know, my husband works from home. So um, there are things that uh, he works at Dell so he, he can work at home and we can still get food on the table and not everybody is that lucky. So um, I have members of my family that are um, essential workers that are having to isolate after uh, contact. I have members of my family, um, that have been laid off. Um, I've been laid off from a job in the past. I know how that feels, but I, you know, um, I, I understand that so many people are really struggling. I recognize people were struggling before COVID, um, with nearly one out of every five of us not having access to healthcare, for example. Um, and so, you know, every day around here is teacher appreciation day. Um, I've got a three and a five-year-old that I'm, um, you know, trying to keep, engaged and not scared from all the things that they're hearing. Um, so I'm, I'm doing great. Um, I am aware of the, uh, extreme amount of what's on the line and, and how important it is that we run the strongest campaign possible. So you asked the ha how the campaign is going, the campaign's going great. Um, we were obviously very concerned when we knew we had to transition to a virtual environment. It's so important that you make one-on-one -on -one personal connections with people. Um, but luckily we did that for the whole year leading up to COVID. We drove tens of thousands of miles across the state. Uh, we built those relationships. We um, raised an army, you know, of volunteers and, and the grassroots energy out there is just crazy, uh, which is awesome. So we have over 56,000 unique donors to the campaign and donations from over 190 counties um, support across the state. Um, we did really well in the primary and, in, in, you know, just across the board. Um, and so I think that we are in a good position heading into the runoff. And I think we're going to go um, as strong as possible in the general after the runoff. We're, we're, we've really built the right team and raised the, the, the resources that it's going to take to really challenge John Cornyn. So I think things are looking good. I believe you just said you had a five-year-old. Um, I do, a three and a five-year-old. Yeah, so luckily uh, homeschooling okay. kindergarten and not, you know, <laughs> well, that's, my, chemistry. that's the biggest question on so many families' minds right now. Um, what are you thinking as a mom going into the fall, not just a Senate candidate, but a mom and all of this debate about public education and what to do? You know, I acknowledge that um, I, I'm not one of these like knee jerk people that with selective outrage so that if this administration does something, I immediately say that it's wrong. That's never been kind of my bag. Um, but I, I have concerns. You know, I, I know that the administration is calling to um, open schools. And um, I know that teachers who I tend to trust and listen to and partner with are, are pushing back against that. 
um, are, are having to choose between their jobs and their lives. A lot of essential workers right now are having to make that de decision as well, whether it's meat packers or nurses or um, just the people that are keeping our society going. Um, and we're not treating those people like essential workers, by the way. But um, when it comes to opening schools, I, I recognize that it's important that essential workers have care for their children. I recognize it's important that um, kids are faced with psychological trauma when they're isolated. I recognize that a lot of times the school is providing nutrition. They're also providing things like screening for abuse. Um, sometimes the abuse at home is being caught by the schools. And so I have concerns that it's, you know, not best for kids to keep schools closed. But I believe if you want to open schools in the fall, you don't demand that they open. You control the pandemic. <laughs> you know, I really don't think that that's too much to ask. Other countries, other states have been able to do it much better than we have here in Texas. I think we should be offering vote by mail. I think that we should be um, widely expanding testing and contact tracing. Um, and so I think if the goal is get schools open in the fall, the, the question should be, how what do we have to do between now and then? That's that's what I'm missing when I look at the leadership right now. I guess because I spent so long in the military, 12 years in the military and five years working in healthcare. In both of those places, we have very data-driven crisis management. We have checklists. We have, you know, when the ICU beds get to this capacity, then we're at level orange. And at level orange, these 12 actions kick in. And I'm just not seeing those like data driven milestone um, decisions being made. I see, I see decisions being made based on what's good for your political party or your reelection campaign, or, you know, it just, um, so I'm, I'm not confident that we're going to have a safe enough environment to open schools. I'm going to be homeschooling my, my five-year-old is turning six in October, um, doing, um, you know, kindergarten and, and luckily he's in kindergarten, like I said, and not junior high. Uh, but I recognize that, um, a lot of people can't do that. So I'm concerned. So the president has been very overt that he views this as the governors need to take the leadership on this. What would tangibly be different in Texas amid this pandemic if you were senator versus Senator John Cornyn? Well, I think that we need to have leaders that aren't afraid to go against the grain to call out failures in leadership. So if John Cornyn was, and, and a lot of his allies too, by the way, um, were not so scared to call um, to call out this administration for withdrawing from the World Health Organization for, you know, way before this pandemic got out of control in the U.S., for, for calling them out for not um, accepting the offered tests from the World Health Organization, by the way. I really think that testing and contact tracing, not closing and masking are the things that would get this pandemic under control. So if, if Cornyn would just, and I mean, not just masking and closing, but if Cornyn would just, you know, grow a, a, a backbone and actually say, all right, look, I recognize you are in my party. I recognize this is going to piss off Mitch McConnell, but in Texas, we're, we're just getting our asses kicked and we really need more access to testing. And we need that testing to be covered and we need more people to have access to healthcare. We finally recognize that, you know, it's actually not in society's best interest to have such a huge chunk of people without healthcare. I would like to hear him acknowledge that. He slipped up the other day on a media interview and acknowledged that, well, luckily people have the Affordable Care Act to fall back on. And yet he's throwing, you know, everything he has at the Affordable Care Act. He's been the repeal's top salesman since it was implemented. And he's still pushing a lawsuit that's going to, you know, try to cripple, try to, you know, take away the entire ACA and take away health care insurance from millions of Texans. There's just so much. I don't know where to go with that answer, Abby. There's so much that he's doing that is not only standing by and not doing enough and being silent and complicit, but also actually taking actions that are making this problem so much worse. And, and from your vantage point, was is the ACA, also known as Obamacare, enough to deal with this, or does federal policy on health care need to go further, per se, to Medicare for all? You know, I was working in health care when the Affordable Care Act um, was implemented, and I got to see the impact on providers and on patients, and I got to see in the finance meetings that I had been attending where, you know, uh, cost of health care was rising so much higher than, uh, you know, GDP, and, and it was unsustainable. And every week we would talk about, this is unsustainable. We're going to have to close hospitals. We can't afford to run this business when we have so many people coming in and, and getting care who aren't covered by insurance because they never are able to pay. 
let alone the fact that that's crippling them, by the way, and, and most people are one major illness or accident away from bankruptcy. I mean, if that's not enough to move you that we need massive healthcare system, systemic overhaul, um, then, you know, the, the hospitals that can't keep their doors open, we have um, a, a, a real problem in rural Texas. One of the pro- one of the problems I worked on when I was in healthcare is how do we get a- how do we get access to healthcare, physical access, not just financial access, to people in rural areas that sometimes have you know to drive an hour with someone who's having a heart attack um, or who don't have access to specialists for sure, even even farther out, um, and we don't have enough broadband access to do telemedicine. I mean, there's just there's a lot of problems already, right? Um, so while I was working in healthcare and the ACA came online, I also saw how it got politicized and sabotaged. And it was very clear that politicians who didn't give a crap if you had health insurance or not, were just trying to tear down an accomplishment because it came from a Democrat. Um, that is selective outrage. That is something that hurts our country. It's something I don't have a lot of tolerance for. Um, And so I believe we need to protect certain provisions like protecting pre-existing conditions. We can't let John Cornyn take us back to a time when we can be sold junk plans and get just, you know, um, uh, I I have two kids. That means I have a pre-existing condition of pregnancy, right? So I can get discriminated against. We just can't allow that to happen. However, I think it's not enough. We're seeing the problem with the employer provided model right now because we have record unemployment in Texas and across the country. It's not a model that is, is working anywhere in the industrialized world, um, I I believe we need a public option because the best care that I ever received was when I was on TRICARE. That was basically military Medicare. Um, And I was was thinking about that while I was pregnant with my first kiddo because I was losing my job in healthcare. We were getting bought out um, and I was getting laid off and realizing that I'm in the state that has one of the highest maternal mortality rates. Um, thinking back to when I had the best health care, it was definitely TRICARE. And because of that, because of that experience, not just looking at data and talking to people, but actually experiencing what it's like to be on Medicare, I'm going to fight like hell for everybody to have access to that. But I think it should be a public option because I also think we need to protect people's choices. And I want people to be able to choose what access to a quality, affordable health care means for them and their family, just like I want them to be able to choose who they love. I want them to choose when to have children and what women do with their bodies. I think we need to do better to preserve choice. Um, and so and we just got a lot of information in the last week from the PPP loan. It's the Paycheck Protection Program. It was actually it's the most noteworthy part of this huge stimulus relief economic effort Congress put forward. Um, But it's gotten so much notice. And we've gotten a sense of the thousands and thousands of Texas businesses that have taken these loans that will most likely be forgiven. Um, And what has been your reaction as we've been able to process that? Um, It's it's basically taxpayer money keeping, and and the idea of it was to keep people from being laid off. That is the intention behind it. it. I don't think anyone thinks it was perfect, but how do you see how that's played out? Well, I think that the economic discussion in an era of COVID is is bigger than that. I think that the economic situation that the tax reform put us in, for example, set us up to not be able to handle the economic crisis we're in now. Um, I think that we need to look at recovering from this pandemic, both from a public health perspective, but the economic piece is if we don't have leaders in place that are going to fight for regular working Texans, then the economy is only going to recover for the strong, powerful special interests and, and the people who actually have the ear of people like John Cornyn right now. So securing financial assistance for struggling small businesses, especially minority-owned businesses who way disproportionately did not receive PPPs, like in the 95% range, um, who've been left out of those small business relief packages. So, you know, we we need to make sure that they can keep their doors open and their workers employed. But of course, if they don't have, we have to address the public health and the economic together, because if they don't have customers, then it doesn't matter how much we do to try to help them keep their doors open, right? Um, We need to provide paid sick leave so that sick and exposed workers workers are not forced to choose between paying their bills and protecting their family's health or feel like they have to come to work when they're sick. When we know a lot of people are spreading COVID who are asymptomatic too, by the way, but that that without that paid sick leave, you have people in essential jobs um, being told they have to come to work, which by the way, we're now having a conversation about whether or not that's going to be teachers. So we're forcing people into an unsafe situation and not giving them paid sick leave, even to care for um, family members that are sick. Um, we have to make sure that we provide funding for Texas's state government 
and cities and counties that are facing massive budget shortfalls so that we can keep essential essential workers, you know, like like um, uh, critical workers like teachers and first responders. I mean, people don't understand that if we keep going down this road, we're going to have bigger problems. It's hard to imagine because we're facing a lot of big problems right now, but we're going to be having even bigger problems. I think that the problem is that there is so much nepotism and uh, corruption and um, decisions based on who you know and things like that, that transparency and accountability are the key. Now, there were transparency and accountability measures written into some of these bills that are not being enforced and are being um, you know, sidestepped by the uh, executive branch when the legislative branch was trying to put that in. We just need to make sure that these measures aren't just going to CEO bonuses, but are actually keeping people on the payrolls. Um, I think that you know we can't have a discussion about um, uh, any of this stuff if we're not talking about securing universal vote by mail um, so that Texans don't have to choose between exercising their constitutional right to vote and jeopardizing their health. It seems like that keeps being the, the choice that we're asking people to make. So the other upheaval we're going through right now is uh, our, our look at um, how criminal justice is administered in this country. Um, can you describe to me um, your approach to being someone in the public arena before and after the death of George Floyd? Um, I don't think it's that different because these are things I've been and others have been calling for for a long time. Police reform, criminal justice reform. It's not different in that aspect, but one thing that has been different that has given me so much hope and optimism is that it seems like these things that we've been fighting for for so long are finally becoming mainstream. And, and I, I do think that if you look at the, you know, the, the science of change management and when you actually get actionable change on things, um, it, it has to reach that mainstream tipping point before there's enough of a call for it. We have way too many people in office right now that just do whatever the public tide and the polling, you know, tells them will get them reelected. If this is an issue now that is going to make people lose their jobs or, or um, lose their, um, you know, status as a senator or whatever, then then good. That means that we're going to actually see the action on it. Um, so I'm glad to see those things be mainstream. That's really the only difference that I've seen is that it's easier to convince people that it's in their best interest, that their neighbor have access to health care in a pandemic. It's easier to convince people we have systemic racism and we do need to have criminal justice and policing reform um, because it's 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 um, finally reaching the the, the forefront. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic that our calls for for these reforms won't fall on deaf ears like they have for so long. I'm I'm optimistic at the bipartisan uh, bills that have been put out there. Um, I think that we're actually going to see reform. The thing that I want to make sure, and this is why. Uh, this upcoming November election is so important. But what I really want to make sure is that we don't stop there, that we make sure I believe that the racism in the, our criminal justice system and, and in um, in policing is really a symptom of a bigger problem that we have. We have a bigger problem that's been plaguing our country for centuries, and that's either implicit bias or structural racism uh, systemically, which is you know similar but different, um, we have to address the discrimination in employment and housing and access to small business capital, healthcare disparities. I mean, we really do need to look at it as a whole and make sure that um, we hold accountable any representatives that act like if we do that work, we're somehow taking away from the haves when it's not a zero sum game. It's, it's just that our country has an opportunity to live up to our title as the leaders of the free world and to live up to our potential as being a beacon of freedom and hope and democracy, but not while that opportunity is not equal for everyone and not while we have an immigration system that speaks the opposite. Um, we just need to get leaders in a position to, to, you know, put these reforms in place that can actually deliver tangible results. Well, you say tangible results. And what I'm watching in Washington right now, I, I don't know if reform is going to pass. And, and there's about a month left of legislating before um, November in reality. Um, I mean, what would you do differently to create compromise? When is the the, the House Democrats are essentially wanting to approach this um, with federal money from a punitive point of view, Republicans on these local police departments, Republicans um, are trying to encourage them, for instance, more funding for better training. Um, the crucial thing in the middle of all this is the chokehold. Where would you compromise on this? You know, I really think that um, when I went into 
when I went to DC to fight Jeff Sessions and to fight the bureaucrats that were trying to keep hundreds of thousands of jobs closed to women in the military, I went while I was working in healthcare. I was a private citizen. I took time off work. I put an unofficial coalition of female women veterans together, and we all went to DC and demanded to speak to our representatives. Um, and we talked to the House and Senate Armed Services Committee staffers about how keeping those jobs closed to women was hurting the military and how it was unconstitutional and all sorts of things. And there were people inside my camp that were like, let's um, let's just ask to open the army jobs. And then once we have data behind how well that goes, then we'll push a little harder and ask to open the Marines and then the special forces. And, and I was like, I don't think that that's actually the way that you build bipartisan coalitions. I don't think it is. Um, co compromise in the in the way that I think you mean it. Like I give up some, you give up some, we meet in the middle. And that, I don't think that that's the way you do it. I, I think that there's times when you have to do that. But the first thing that I would do, I pushed back on those people in my camp and I said, no, we're not going to ask to just open some jobs because that really shows that we think it's not important enough that it needs to be, look, this, this, we need to, to enact this immediately. It's hurting the military recruiting and retention. It's tying the hands of the commanders in the field. We can make the argument, but we need to not go in there trying to expect them to accept our reasons. They're not going to go and listen to our motivations and say, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. We have to be leaders and sacrifice our own egos and be humble and go in and figure out what their values are and then speak to those values. And what do I mean by that? Like I could go and talk to Democrats about, hey, this is unconstitutional and it's um, wrong and it's a women's rights issue that women should be able to apply for com competing for these jobs. We don't wanna lower standards, but women should be able to compete for them. But that argument wouldn't work on the other side. So I would have to go there and instead of insisting that they acknowledge that women can do these jobs because I just did the job and they're looking at me and telling me they didn't think women could do those jobs, um, you have to be humble and you have to accept and swallow and just, you know, be offended and say, OK, let me speak to the values that matter to you. The Joint Chiefs unanimously are standing with me and saying we need to open these jobs. The, the commanders in the field are saying it's tying their hands. It's hurting recruiting. It's hurting retention. And women are already in combat. The, the, the law isn't keeping women from combat. It's just hurting the military. And being able to do that, we got the Republican support to open those jobs too. And I think we can do that with things like climate change and gun violence. Um, you know, climate change, we don't need to argue about the science. I believe the science but not everybody does. And instead of getting offended by that and trying to convince them of the science, I can go and talk to them about the fact that, you know, the energy industry is really important to Texas's economy. And I'm concerned about all of those energy jobs if we are stubbornly holding on to the last century's technology and not recognizing that the future of the energy industry is in renewable energy. That's where the globe is trending. And we're going to lose those jobs like Blockbuster did if we don't jump on board and start investing in the next chapter of energy. That's moving the needle on climate change without arguing about something that we're not gonna agree on. So I just don't think that we have to compromise away our values. We just have to be willing to have the conversation with people that, that reaches out to them and talks to them about their values. So I'm gonna turn to the campaign. So we're just a few days out from election day, early voting's happening. I believe you voted this morning, is that correct? I did, yeah. Um, it is getting kind of rough. Uh, between you and Senator West, um, particularly on racial and gender lines. Um, whether or not you are the nominee, does the party come together on July 15th? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that there's no question that we do. We're so divided as a country and uh, some people would divide us as a party. Um, we definitely see Republicans trying to come in and divide us as a party. I'm not going to let that happen. And I think enough people alongside me are not going to let that happen. There is just too much on the line. It is just too important. The kids that are in cages on our southern border, they don't care about a bickering fight between two politicians. They don't care about a pathetic slap fight on social media. Um, I am so laser focused on getting people access to health care, on getting comprehensive immigration reform that's more in line with our American values, that it doesn't embarrass us to talk to our allies. I mean, I talk to the people that I served with on a 19 country coalition and they say, what the hell are you guys doing? We're supposed to be looking to y'all as an example of, of a democracy. What's happening over there? And I say, I know, just, just hang in there and watch the next election. And I promise as we'll come out and, and show you who we are as a country. I, I believe that. Um, so I am so focused on 
the the mission. You know, when when I was flying a combat mission, I wasn't always getting along with the people that I was in the cockpit with, but we would disagree about tactics or whatever else in the mission planning room. And then we would come up with a mission. We would remember what was at stake, what's important, go out and save that person's life. And that's what I'm focused on doing. And I think that enough people realize that it's not just me. I've been working a very coordinated campaign with down ballot candidates and we are ready to get to work. So if you were not to win on Tuesday, would you campaign for him? And if the roles were reversed, would you want him to campaign on your behalf in the fall? I mean, you know, I, I'm going to keep fighting to get kids out of cages. I'm going to keep fighting to get people access to health care in whatever form that looks like. And so earlier this week, my colleague Patrick Vitek and I reported that Emily's List, a group that has endorsed you, um, has put a whole bunch of money into this race, uh, the Senate Democratic campaign arm, and then you put your own money in. Um there's been a real escalation, which is somewhat normal at the close of a campaign, but it is a lot of money. Um, and a lot of folks are looking into this and wondering, is Senator West closing on you? Um, do you have any internal um, data indicating one way or the other of where the race is in the final days? So when you say I put in my own money, I want to be clear that I haven't spent a penny. Oh, of I meant your campaign. So Claire. you mean my campaign's money? Your because campaign that you proud. Yeah, yes. no, I mean, I actually do think that there are a lot of people who um, are able to put in their own money. And no, I have never been one of those people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's not what I meant. Apologies. No, yeah. Um, so um, I, I think it's an important point, though, because I'm so proud of the grassroots campaign that we built. Um, we It's why we've been able to exponentially increase our momentum and not lose momentum despite COVID. I mean, COVID has made it really hard for a lot of campaigns to raise money, but not us. We keep posting a stronger quarter every quarter. We've got over 56,000 unique donors, over three quarters of the counties across the state. Um, so we're really excited and proud of that grassroots foundation. Um, and, you know, as far as how much money is being spent in the race, um, if you look at the ads that are going up, they're very focused on the general election. Um, we are recognizing that we're going to win this runoff. I'm very confident about that. Um, and then on July 15th, I mean, we're already seeing Republicans trying to meddle in our primary. On July 15th, we expect a barrage of attacks on us from John Cornyn and from his his you know allies in the private prison industry and the gun lobby and um, the big pharma and the insurance industry. Um, and and we need to be able to define who. I am and what I'm fighting for before John Cornyn tries to come in and define that for us, because we've we've already seen that he's willing to lie about us. And so it's just important that people know when he starts attacking me who I am. And I think that that's what you're seeing right now is people getting excited that they're seeing the polling between me and John Cornyn tighten up. People recognizing that Texas is a, battle, a battlefield state. People recognizing we have 38 electoral votes. Um, you see a lot of the Trump uh, campaigns coming to Texas and, and trying to rally. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's 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 completely the money that you're seeing get spent in the race is completely a factor of people realizing what's happening here in Texas. So when we look at fundraising among other Democratic Senate candidates, um, Kentucky, the Democrat there raised 17 million, South Carolina, 14 million. This is the last three months. Montana, 8 million, Iowa, 6 million, Kansas, 4 million. I believe you raised 1.7 Um mm -hmm. Texas is a huge ATM, even for Democratic politics, even though it's more known Republican. Um, why are you behind these other guys? And also, Texas is more expensive. Are you going to have the money, if you are the nominee, to take on Cornyn, who has about $14 million, if I recall? Yeah, and we are still in a primary, and a lot of those other campaigns aren't. And, you know, I, I am very confident that we are going to have the resources that we need. Um, we have been able to build the relationships with our allies, like, um, you know, like you just mentioned with Planned Parenthood, Vote Vets is another group that I'm so proud to, to have the support of. Um, so, you know, but I do believe we're going to raise, we, we've got the grassroots enthusiasm. We've got so many people that are, are just kind of um, uh, excited about engaging in the general. Um, there's a lot of politics right now in the, in the runoff because of the position that you know, my opponent holds in the runoff. Um, so, you know, I, I am very confident that on July 15th, some of the people who have been holding back and waiting to get in are going to jump in. Um, and I'm also confident that, and that's part of why you see so many people spreading our message across the state right now, Abby, it's not because we're afraid we're going to lose a runoff, but it's because we really need to tighten up those polling numbers. And with a third of the, the state undecided, 
And John Cornyn has a 36% approval rating and a 40% disapproval, but not enough people know who I am. If we can spread the word and get my name ID up and get people to understand I am a combat veteran and a working mom and a fighter, and I've already been successful taking on the dark forces in DC, we do that. And all of a sudden those undecided numbers are gonna come to us. And once we can tighten up the race and make it even closer than it is now, which within seven is pretty good for this far out, um, we're gonna see a real increase in the fundraising. Um, looking at Kentucky and that primary, there were a lot of similarities. I mean, many, many similarities um, of the of profiles of the candidates. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you you were, I believe, even in an ad with Amy McGrath last cycle uh, when y'all were House candidates. Um, I that um, Serve America put out an ad with all the female veterans. Yeah. I just remember I had a Springsteen song, and that's what I recall from it. But <laughs> um, so what did you take away from that? Because... Um, the state legislator who is was similar to Senator West closed very strong. Did you were you nervous watching that? Were you thinking maybe that might replicate in Texas or what was your mindset there? I, I really I don't look to other states to to figure out what's going to happen in Texas. Texas is so unique among among the states. We're the Lone Star State. We're 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 not going to take a page out of really anybody else's book um, on on either coast, frankly. Um, and because I'm the one who had the progressive endorsements of the organizations like Planned Parenthood and um, people like Elizabeth Warren, um, it's just it was it's a very different race than than what happened in Kentucky. So no, it didn't didn't distract me too much from the mission at hand, which is taking on John Cornyn. Well, on that front, um, hang on, let me find it. Uh, we had a reader question um, from Leon. What is your strategy and message to beat John Cornyn? So people need to understand that um, Ted Cruz has a 50, had a 52% approval rating when he went uh, up for re-election last cycle, and John Cornyn has a 36, and the two of them vote exactly the same. So what would make the Texans that are answering these questions approve of Ted Cruz and not of John Cornyn. And, and it's truly, um, uh, it, it's, it's completely the fact that John Cornyn clearly doesn't have a spine and asks Mitch McConnell, you know, what color his socks should be that day or whatever process he goes through in his decision-making. Um, and Texans can abide a lot. Texans can abide bad policy and um, mistakes in leadership, but they, they, we don't abide a, a, a bootlicker very well. Um, so I think the strategy is to show people that John Cornyn is a career politician who lives at the top of an ivory tower, metaphorically, um, and doesn't understand the plight of regular working people. He is not fighting to protect Social Security because he's on three taxpayer-funded pensions. I am worried about whether or not Social Security is going to be there for me. I have worried about where am I going to get my health care when I got laid off. I've bartended and waited tables. I have served my country in uniform and understand the cost of deploying troops and that it should be a last resort and that our State Department must be robust and healthy as a frontline defense for our military and that we shouldn't be stealing funds from the military for, to construct an ineffective wall and that people who are making these decisions about our national security and our foreign policy are are not well versed in the best practices of national security and foreign policy when they're only making their choices based on politics. If we show voters that John Cornyn is working for his corporate allies and his donors instead of Texans, which is why he votes against, consistently votes against bipartisan immigration reform, because he gets checks from the private detention centers. He consistently votes against very popular, low-hanging fruit, common sense gun safety measures like universal background checks that have the approval of over 88% of Texans, by the way, because he gets checks from the gun lobby. Once people know who John Cornyn is, it's going to be very easy to beat him. The question is, are we going to be able to raise the resources and do the work it takes to get that message out to a huge state like Texas? And I believe we're proving right now that we are. So I had a Republican tell me, a Texas Republican. Well, I'll backtrack. So I've been covering you about three years. Um, you ran for Congress, as you know, two years ago, and you almost won. You almost defeated Congressman John Carter, who, in our conversations three years ago, I was very skeptical of that race, um, <laughs> traditionally. And I, I own my skepticism. Um, it's uh, well, he won his last midterm by 32 points. So, so you know, that, your skepticism was, um, you know, understandable, but I knew that things were changing. Yeah. So it's it's a suburban district and it's an, a rural district. And I had a Republican tell me maybe about a week ago, man, if she'd run again for that district, she would 
probably be a congresswoman elect right now. Yeah, um, I think so too. So, I mean, do you do you have any doubts in your decision? And I also I'm I am deducing I don't know it for a fact on at least one angle of this, but I am assuming both chambers of Congress recruited you on the Democratic side. Yeah. What was that deliberation like as you're deciding between which seat to run or which where to yeah. run? If I was making the determination of what seat to run for based on what was best for me and putting me in a position of power with a with a brass nameplate and and a staff, then, yeah, I would have run for Congress again. It would have been much easier to win that seat. I'm not looking for uh, a bullet on my resume. I'm looking to get kids out of cages. I'm looking to get access to health care. And I am looking to stop the continuous legislative graveyard blocking even a vote on great legislation that would really help Texans, um, but also looking to stop the con consistent and constant confirmation of hyper-partisan, ultra-conservative judges that I believe are going to be the greatest threat to our democracy over the next several decades. That's that's the the insidious underlying kind of under the under the surface of the water thing that's happening that I think is a huge threat to our democracy. It used to be you had to prove how objective you were. And in McConnell's Senate right now, you have to prove how loyal you are to the, the, the Federalist Society to get confirmed. That's a huge threat. Um, so I'm running for this seat and not that seat because my goal is not to get into office. My goal is to move the needle on our values to protect women's reproductive freedom and the LGBTQ plus community's rights. And I can't do that. I don't think it's effective to just um, now, don't get me wrong. There are several congressional races that I am supporting and excited about. I think we're going to add three or four seats to our congressional delegation from Texas. But I didn't think that if I could just beat Carter, I would be. Um, doing enough when I saw that it was very clear that I could take on Cornyn. If I if I didn't think I could beat Cornyn, yeah, I would have run for that congressional seat because I think we do need more Democratic voices in the House. But the fact that I could beat Cornyn, by the way, Abby, I mean, I, I lost by 2.9% in an R plus 10 district and was able to flip two House seats still. We need nine more House seats. I know I can run the coordinated campaign again that's going to do that. And in an R plus 10 district, that I outperformed all of the statewide candidates in the rural half in an R plus eight state, which I would argue we're a little better than that right now. Um, if that district had been an R plus eight state or an R plus eight district, we would have won. So in, in, a, in a strange way, this is actually an easier race because it's less, it's, we don't have to worry about the gerrymandering, right? That district was very gerrymandered and much redder than the rest of the state. So my message and my vision for our state is based on Texas values. And I know that that's why um, not, we're not only going to get the Democrats to turn out because I am a Democrat and I'm fighting for the things that Democrats fight for, but I'm able to communicate to independent voters why those things are also going to help them keep food on the table, keep a roof over their kids' heads without having to work three jobs and miss everything about their kids growing up. So I have about 10,000 other politics questions, but I am going to turn to the idea of if you are a senator. Um, and the biggest difference between the race last cycle and this one um, is, and it was on my mind this morning, um, is that as a Senator, you would have a say in Supreme court nominations. Um, you are very out there as being, um, s supporting abortion rights. Um, and we assume, um, uh, well beyond that, what would you look for in a nominee's background and temperament? Um, if there's a particular justice right now, who you think is a great, is the best one, what are what is because that is probably the most far reaching decision you will make outside of voting to go to war with some with another country. What is your thought on this? You know, um, I feel like people sometimes get lost and, and they see Supreme Court decisions that surprise them because they mistake the Supreme Court decision. They think that it means so, for example, the Supreme Court decision upholding DACA recently was not the Supreme Court saying we'll defend DACA. It was on a technicality. They're ruling on legal issues. And you really shouldn't, in a perfect world, you shouldn't be able to say the liberal court justices and the conservative court justices and be able to predict how they're going to vote based on the content of the subject matter. It should be on the legal arguments. And, and I would like to see us get to a place where the judicial branch is nonpartisan and is not making those decisions based on party affiliation. Uh, look, watching the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, yes, obviously, I was, as a survivor of sexual assault myself, I was very 
upset and, 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 you know, um, distrustful and, and listening to a lot of the things that were going on in that category. But the thing I thought that I would have been watching for as a Senator in those confirmation hearings was the, the complete lack of a, of a, of, of justice Kavanaugh feeling like he needed to prove to the, to the group that he would be objective and nonpartisan. We're missing that. We need that. We're so divided in our country. We should be able to look to the Supreme Court as some kind of, you know, voice of reason that's going to just to dis- decide things based on their legal merit and not, you know, whether or not they support the subject matter. So what I'll be looking for are patriots who want to do their job, who don't have an agenda, who aren't doing it out of an alliance to a political party, but are going to be ruling fairly and helping us. I mean, the the cases that even make it to them because the federal courts are being packed so much with these uh, people who are largely not qualified or deemed not qualified by the uh, American Bar Association and all, all sorts of other problems. I mean, if you want to lose some sleep tonight, go and read some of the transcripts of some of these confirmation <laughs> hearings. They're they're painful. Um, so what I'm going to be looking for is somebody who is actually qualified to hold the job, who is going to um, be a patriot and put the good of our country first and make sound legal rulings based on the merit of the legal argument in front of them and not based on politics. So one of the things that I've been in Washington about 14 years and the Texas delegation when I got here was a powerhouse Um, and it has diminished in cohesion. And it was a powerhouse because it was so cohesive. Um, It came together for Hurricane Harvey relief, but I'm not so sure it could come together um, in another round. You would be a U.S. senator. Mm. What would you do to build that power or do you view that as the role of the senator? I mean, I think that that's why I have been running such a strong, coordinated campaign, because I recognize that the things that I want to accomplish, I can't do by myself. I'm not going to be able to get that done by myself. I'm not going to be able to get aggressive action on climate change and and gun safety legislation and health care reform, immigration reform without, um, you know, people on my wing. Right. Um, I believe if we can just try to put some of the partisan bickering aside and start electing servant leaders and start electing Texans, people that are more, anytime you look between, between two candidates, obviously I think it's better to make a policy differentiation decision first, but if all things are equal, then pick the person who is more Texas than DC. I just think we have too much DC and we need more Texas values like strength. And uh, we call it intestinal fortitude. It's, you know, uh, highfalutin words for guts, right? We just need more people that can stand up to the powerful special interests. Look, DC is a very intimidating place. You know that, Abby, probably from, if you can remember when you first got there, maybe not so much anymore, but a lot of people get elected and they go to DC well-intentioned with stars in their eyes and they're gonna save the world. And then they see how things are done and they succumb to the system and the system is broken. The system is based on corporate donors and political quid pro quo and people looking out for themselves, the self-interest and the resumes and the, the egos and the power and not enough people. There are some, but not enough people there serving their constituents and actually trying to make our country stronger. They just want to score political points. So if we can just elect more people who are servant leaders and from Texas that are that are Texans um, and not D.C., then I think we're going to see that that happen again, that cohesion. OK, so I have two questions left in two minutes. Um, if you win, your fellow senator will be Ted Cruz. How does that work? I'm really looking forward to to working with Ted Cruz because I hear stories about him eating lunch by himself in the Senate chow hall and that nobody can work with him. And I got to tell you, Abby, I'm really looking forward to seeing him in the Senate dining hall and grabbing my tray and saying, hey, Ted, how's it going? Let's talk about immigration reform. Hey, we still got kids in cages. Hey, how about that one out of every five Texans doesn't have health insurance? And he's going to be like, oh, my God, MJ, can I just eat my lunch in peace? So I'm very much looking forward to chatting with him. Uh, I've seen him work with AOC and people like that. Like I've seen that he, if you make the case to him that something is, is best for Texans, um, there's a glimmer of hope there that if, if, if I spend enough time with him showing him how it can make our state stronger, that, you know, maybe I can get him to, to go along with me. It's how I built a broad bipartisan coalition when I was there last time. Um, and we'll see if he runs for reelection again after four years of eating lunch with me. And my last question for you is, it's more of a personal question. Um, what is the thing you miss most culturally in the pandemic, whether it's sports, uh, a particular music, anything like that? What do you miss most? 
Um, you know, I, I miss being able to talk to people in person. I, 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 um, on the campaign trail, um, well, you know, uh, in addition to that, I would say I am a, a huge Texas football fan, so I'm going to miss, you know, going to Texas football games. Um, I miss being able to go to like a water park or a, a park with my kids and have them play with other kids. Um, I feel like that's something that, um, that, that I really miss. So, Yeah. Well, we thank you so much for your time. And to our audience, thank you for turning in. Thank you to all of our sponsors and partners for supporting today's event. And thank you to Major Hager for joining us. Finally, if you want to become a Texas Tribune member and support our ongoing election coverage, go to texastribune.org slash give. Have a wonderful day to you, Major Hager, and to the audience and to everyone uh, at the Tribune back home. Take care. Thanks, Abby. Take care. Thank you. Stay safe. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas believes in honest conversations like the one you're about to see. For thoughtful insights related to healthcare policy, check out our Blue Promise podcast and videos. Learn more at standingwithtexas.com.